And now we're going to move on to um, methods to identify our service lines. So some of the methods that we talk about during our trainings then is the visual field inspections, the camera curb box inspections, uh, the CCTV internal pipe scope inspections, um, potholing or vacuum excavations, and then targeted service line sampling. So just to go through these real quick, um, our visual inspections, uh, like we said, if they can get access into that building, seeing where that service line is coming in um, and being able to identify a lead line with a characteristic wipe joint. Um, so in the picture on the left, we have lead and on the right, we have a copper line coming into a home. Um, the city of Pittsburgh did a lot of work with the camera curb box inspections. Um, so they took a look at their curb box um, which is right here, that hollow tube that leads to the shutoff valve. Um, at that point, they can um, take cameras down inside once they clear everything out, and they can visually see the exterior portion of not only the water system side, but then also the customer side. Um, so here we just have a cutaway. So being able to take cameras down there and seeing the water system side at that, at that point and the uh, customer side. Again, just a narrow vision there. Um, um, and then what Pittsburgh did is they took that information and they put it um, through their mapping so that they could then tell uh, what portions of the service lines were what materials. And so you can go to Pittsburgh website and you can see their mapping and you click on an address and it pulls everything up. Um, so that's a, a good use of that. Some of the hurdles that Pittsburgh had was actually finding the curb boxes at some of the locations and then being able to clean them out. Um, and then also some of the imagery might not have been clear enough to make those identifications. So here we have the cameras going down into the curb box and then um, the visuals coming back uh, to be identified for later. And some of those examples were also in the EPA guidance document. And these are just photos out of that document from Pittsburgh a lead service line on the left, uh, non-lead service line in the middle, and then again, like I said, some of the imagery, they couldn't determine uh, what the makeup was. And then some systems uh, like uh, the city of Tucson, Arizona, they used closed circuit television inspections internally uh, for their water service lines. Um, with this, you can um, obviously, you would have to shut the water off and go in through the meter in order to do this, uh, taking a camera, and you can see more of the service line versus just points here and there. So that is a benefit of the um, internal inspection. The negative, however, is that um, our systems that have corrosion control treatment on, um, obviously, if they have their scale build up they wouldn't be able to necessarily see the makeup of the pipe itself. They would be seeing the inside of the scales and so forth. Or if they have any kind of corrosion on the inside of the pipe, they not, might not be able to identify the material makeup. Uh, with our potholing and vacuum excavation, we're taking high pressure air or water and um, removing the soil so that then you could uh, see the external portion of the service line itself. Um, this is a faster and cheaper way than excavating the entire service line. Of course, you would want to identify those points along that service line, um, both for other utilities in the area, but also you want to make sure that you capture the, the entirety of the service line, uh, the makeup of the, those portions. Um, and here's just a graphic, uh, the pros and cons of uh, test pit methods, both using a manual excavation hand digging tools uh, versus the uh, vacuum excavation. And with the vacuum excavation, obviously it could be faster and less disruptive in that the footprint of that size um, hole that you would need in order to determine, you know, get cameras down in there, take pictures to identify the exterior portion of the service line. However, you do need specialized equipment for potholing or maybe specialized crews to run that. Um, and both would potentially cause disturbance to that service line. Uh, the city of Flint used hydrovacking um, extensively in 2017 to try to speed up the process so they could identify where the lead it was within their system. So they did use hydrovacking, but what they um, 
saw then once they were doing excavations was that they were missing the splices. So beyond the shutoff valve where they were one material close to the shutoff valve where they were, and then there were splices further on where it was still lead on the service line. Um, so they ceased hydrovacking and went to full excavations. Another tool that systems might want to do is targeted service line sampling, um, where we're just uh, doing lead sampling, uh, water sampling, a uh, flushed or fifth draw, or sometimes sequential sampling. We want to know the water quality of the service line itself, not the premise plumbing. So these samples are not compliance monitoring. These are separate, separate targeted service line samples to um, identify whether or not they have a lead or galvanized requiring placement service line. So for each of the systems, this is going to be different to try to get a background threshold level, if you will. Um, so if a system, depending on what corrosion control treatment they may have, they will have to do a sampling to know uh, water quality from a service line that's definitely a lead service line and get that background threshold. Some of the water systems that have used this sampling, um, they might say uh, greater than five uh, micrograms per liter as they're cut off for their target. Anything above that would be considered a lead or galvanized service line or galvanized requiring placement service line. So again, that's going to be different for all systems to get that background, background threshold level of what they you know, for their particular system. Also, each service line would have a different volume depending on the premise plumbing. Um, you know, where is our volume? So which leader do I need to sample to get that specific service line is going to change for each individual um, property. And, um, and this uh, type of targeted service line cannot be used to determine a non-lead service line. Again, just an example of uh, what we mean by sequential monitoring, uh, you know, a first draw sample and then the premise plumbing and then the ex, uh, these last couple leaders are really what we want to capture with the service line with these targeted service uh, line samples. Again, the time of year would also have a, a play in this because obviously we want systems if they're entertaining doing any sort of the sampling to do that during the warmer months of the year as well. If systems are choosing to do targeted service line samples, we just ask um, that they mark their chain of custodies as not reportable to DEP or use the S code for special sampling. Um, however, if they do get a sample result greater than 15 parts per billion, we would ask that they contact DEP. Just let their sanitary know that they're doing targeted service line samples and then the sanitary will provide them information uh, for that customer to do flushing and so forth to um, limit that lead intake. Computer modeling, predictive modeling, also another tool that systems may choose. Um, again, we see this mainly for our larger systems, um, compiling that data for their system and you know as a starting point they're making inferences of areas so they they have known areas potentially where they have lead um, service lines and they're making inferences on the unknown areas of their system with these models they would also have to be updated so as they're moving through their system and actually identifying their materials you know we would want them to then feed that information back into the model so that they get the most accuracy out of that model as they're going through and verifying their materials as well. And then other methods to detect, uh, to detect uh, lead service lines. Again, um, there might be some other technology that will be available, hopefully. Uh, some of this you might have heard the Water Research, Research Foundation, uh, lead pipe detection by electrical resistance. So all metals would have a different electrical resistance. Um, so this could be a potentially a way um, to identify that service line and makeup without having to do excavation. Um, so some more work and research um, in the works for this. So hopefully that's something that's on the horizon here. Another thing is passive sampling. So this, uh, if they have a point of use filter put on, 
they're actually sampling that particular filter after it's on that particular tap for an extended period of you know however many gallons they want run through that um, and then the, the filter itself is tested for lead not the water in this case it would be the actual filter is tested for total lead and um, again this is just another tool potentially for systems to identify whether or not they have a lead or galvanized requiring replacement line. Same thing though, they would have to, that community would have to have specific thresholds developed um, out from sampling based on known lead service lines and sampling from non-lead service lines as well, just to get that background information as to what level. Again, if uh, systems are looking at to one of these um, other technologies that aren't on our spreadsheet currently, um, they should reach out to our tech services section. Our central office tech service section is looking into some of these other technologies as well. So if a system is kind of entertaining some of these other um, methods or they hear something else that they're interested in, you know, before deploying that in their system, they should reach out and make sure that that's a, a viable resolution uh, that DEP is OK with. Just kind of summarize um, the water systems approach into doing their service line inventories. Um, again, trying to determine within their system that that date when lead was last used in their system. Um, so if they're going off of 1991 or if they had an ordinance in place that was earlier than that, then that may be their date and then going through their records and doing their review, um, doing any on-site visualization that they can do, and then moving on to their field verification methods. And some of the resources that we put in the, um, the workbook as well, obviously reference to the guidance document and the web link that came out last August where they can get more additional information. Um, the lead service line replacement collaborative has a lot of good information. So just giving them that uh, web link as well um, with other information on preparing inventories and communication resources. And then I also pointed to the, As um, the ASWA website. And once they get to the ASWA website, they could also look up this um, the uh, white paper that was done with asthma and blue conduit as just like um, kind of a lessons learned from Flint. And one of the lessons that I just pointed out in this is based on historical records alone, Flint had thought they had only 20% of lead in their system. But then after over 25,000 excavations, they realized that 51% of their service lines were actually lead. So records alone were not accurate. 